so hi everyone. My name is Andre Meshkov, and I'm the CTO of Edgard. And today I'll be talking about uh, eDNS client subnet, uh, which is a crucial mechanism uh, DNS servers use to deliver more accurate responses based on client's uh, geographic location. But first, a few words about Edgar DNS, just for you to understand why we are interested in that. Uh, Edgar DNS is a widely used public resolver. Uh, we estimate that about 80 million people uh, all over the world rely on our service. But at the same time, we operate a small network of uh, a small number of points of presence. It's just 16 of them at the moment. And that's why we're interested in a solution that allows us uh, to serve accurate responses regardless of the server location. Uh, traditionally, uh, CDN providers uh, relied on uh, on the recursive DNS server location uh, in order to steer users' traffic uh, to the content servers located closer to them. This worked well, uh, well for quite some time. Uh, but with time, the situation changed and public public resolvers became more and more prevalent. Uh, the likes of Google DNS, Edgar DNS, Cloudflare, et cetera, et cetera. And with time, uh, the recursive location uh, was not a reliable signal anymore. Uh, I have seen... Uh, I have seen numbers on the APNIC website, and as far as I understand, uh, currently, it's just about 65% of users who are using their uh, uh, the DNS recursive provider provided by their ISPs. Uh, and there's a lot of users who well, prefer to use public DNS recursives. Uh, consider this case, uh, well, from our experience. A uh, user from India will be most likely routed to our Singapore location. And in the case of using traditional DNS, name servers will only be able to rely on uh, our recursive location and they will serve the response that works best for a Singaporean users, uh, but not for an Indian user. So that's a problem. Uh, fortunately, there is a solution to this problem, and it's called uh, eDNS Client Subnet, or ECS. And the design of this feature is simple. Uh, the client subnet is included in the DNS query uh, to name servers. Uh, and now when the name server sees this ECS extension, uh, it can use it and disregard the IP address the, it received the query from. Uh, and just make a decision uh, based on the uh, subnet from the ECS extension. What kind of decision this could be? Uh, the most popular way uh, is, uh, as I said, to use geo-steering, uh, and it's used by virtually all CDN providers out there. Uh, well, why they use it when there's any cost? Well, it's more reliable and more manageable than any cost will ever be. So uh, nothing will change here. Uh, there are other things that can be used for online advertising restrictions, et cetera, et cetera. For instance, I've seen a case when a name server refused to respond to a DNS query unless uh, the IP address uh, in the ECS was from a particular country. Uh, what's interesting is, uh, according to our data, uh, EDNS client subnet is very popular. From what we're seeing, about 67 of 67% uh, of DNS queries are for domain names, which name servers indicate ECS support. But there are some issues. And first and foremost, uh, this is a privacy issue. Despite the fact that the recursor only sends a subnet and not the exact IP address, this is still a lot more information than the name server is supposed to see. Uh, there are legal issues, consent issues. Uh, the user 
has no idea that the DNS server will send their IP addresses to some name servers. It, the user never consented to that. And even the IRFC itself admits this problem and does not recommend enabling ECS by default. But privacy issues is not the only problem. Uh, the other issue may be even more important to someone uh, is the negative impact on caching efficiency. On the slide, you can see a real life example of how DNS cache can be affected when ECS is enabled. Uh, of course, the numbers might be different. It depends on the load of your server, but anyway, here, here are the real numbers and the impact is quite negative. So now we know that there are some serious issues with ECS, uh, but do we actually need it? Is there another way? And there are some DNS uh, recursor operators that argue that they can live without it. For instance, Cloudflare argues that their cache is sufficiently localized as they have hundreds of points of presence uh, and they very well may be right. But what if you operate a DNS recursor with a smaller number of points of presence? Uh, and what about the case with some large content providers like Google, uh, Facebook, Netflix, and et cetera, uh, which have their caching servers inside ISP networks? Uh, it would be rather hard to have a DNS recursive server in every ISP network. So to summarize all of that, if you're operating a public DNS resolver, then most likely you need to rely on ECAs, ECS if you want to make your responses accurate. So talking about solutions, there is actually one solution which was first proposed by NextDNS in 2019. Uh, and the idea is actually very simple. Uh, what if we replace subnets with AS numbers? Uh, wouldn't it solve all our problems? Let's just think about it. Uh, there are way fewer AS numbers than there are subnets. In theory, it considerably improves caching efficiency. And there's also a huge privacy boost because, well, AS number is not as precise as a subnet. Of course, you cannot simply put the S number uh, in the ECS extension. That's not how it's supposed to work. So what do we do instead? Uh, first, we build a map uh, where the key is the IS number and the value is some random sub subnet that's announced by this IS. <laughs> then when you receive a DNS query from a user, you look up the IS number the IP address belongs to. There are several ways to do that. You can use like MaxMind, AP location, et cetera, et cetera. Once you figured out the IS number, you check with the map we previously built and get the subnet corresponding to the IS number. And finally, you use the subnet in the ECS extension that goes further to name service. Okay, we've got it all up and running. So how good is it? Uh, there are two thing, things that we'll need to assess. Uh, first is caching efficiency, and the second is actual accuracy of the responses. We'll talk about accuracy later. Let's focus on the efficiency first. So this is what we observed. Uh, hit miss ratio uh, went up to 75, 80%, depending on the location. Uh, note that uh, the ECS cache in our case is five times bigger than the regular cache. Uh, so if the sizes were the same, uh, the numbers might have been worse. But anyway, uh, so comparing these two caches, hit miss ratio is 50% worse than the regular DNS cache. Not bad already, uh, but can we do better? And there are several ways to improve cache and efficiency for a reasonable cost. And the first thing we tried is reducing the number of AS numbers that we use as keys. So how do we do that? For every country, we choose a number of the most popular AS numbers. Uh, we do that based on our metrics. And then if the server receives a query uh, from an AS that is not on the list, 
uh, we use the most popular IS from the user's country instead. We played with different numbers. And uh, here are the results. On the left side, you can see the most inaccurate approach. So it's just like top 10 IS numbers per country. And we discard ev every uh, IS number from which we receive fewer than 3% of queries. And on the right side, a little bit more precise approach, uh, up to 50 IS numbers per, per country. It is, and we discard uh, AS numbers from which we receive fewer than 0.1% queries. And the results are pretty well, pretty good. Inaccurate approach is very close to the regular DNS cache efficiency, five times uh, five percent worse. And the accurate approach, accurate, uh, is uh, eight percent worse than the regular cache. Uh, but that's not all. Next slide, please. There's also uh, there's also another thing that can be used to improve the cache efficiency. Yeah, it was outlined in the next DNS blog post. The problem was outlined. Uh, they noticed that some name servers uh, indicate ECS support and responses, but in fact, they actually return the same IP address every time regardless of where the query comes from. You know, well, simply just pollute the cache. Uh, and I made a simple script to analyze 1,000 popular domains. You can find it on GitHub. Uh, and here are the results that I got. Uh, about a half of all domains indicate ECS support, uh, which means they respond with a non-zero scope. And about a third of that, uh, despite the fact that ECS support is indicated, uh, return the same IP address regardless of what subnet is sent in the DNS query. So it makes no sense uh, to use ECS cache for them. Now, if we forcibly use regular DNS cache for them, we can improve cache efficiency even more. Unfortunately, we haven't yet implemented that on our site in production, so it's a work in progress, but uh, I still find this interesting and maybe useful. So are we good now? Unfortunately, not entirely or not at all. Uh, first of all, there's an issue of large ISPs. There are some ISPs that can announce prefixes from lots of different places uh, using just one IS number uh, is simply not enough to achieve the necessary precision. Let's take uh, Comcast, for example. Uh, according to MaxMind data, uh, their, the prefixes they, they announce uh, can be attributed to 1,600 different cities and 45 different regions. Uh, and if you just use uh, one random subnet for every query you got from cost Comcast, uh, you can run into your problem. So here's an example. On the left side is a query that uses one random Comcast subnet and the response IP location is uh, on the West Coast. And on the right side, uh, a different subnet is used and the response IP location is on the East Coast. So, well, this is hardly the ideal outcome. So what can be done about that? Uh, one solution is to make the cache more granular and use more parameters. And here's what we tried. We added country and subdivision region to the subnet selection algorithm. And we assumed that the problem is mostly with the ISPs from large countries, uh, countries. So we don't need to do that for small European countries, for instance. Uh, yeah, we just chose like a select few. And in the end, uh, the resulting responses are more precise. And surprisingly, uh, cache inefficiency stays pretty much the same. Does it solve all our problems? Well, yes and no. Uh, on one hand, we indeed managed to make the responses more accurate and 
uh, at the same time to keep our cash efficient. Uh, on the other hand, we are not as accurate as pure EC ECS, uh, obviously. And there are still problems. For instance, uh, I told you about the problem with large ISNs. There's another problem with small ISPs. Uh, for instance, uh, what from what I've seen, uh, I've seen a small Bangladesh ISP uh, that didn't get to our top ASN list. And we were using uh, the top Bangladesh provider instead. Uh, and the IP addresses that were returned by TikTok, uh, they just didn't work uh, in the network of this small ISP. I'm not sure what was the reason, but that was the case. So we are yet to see what kind of problems we will uh, we will run into uh, using this approach. Uh, but anyways, uh, once we run and once we fix all these problems, I'll come again and tell you about that. Uh, so that's all. Uh, thank you so much for the attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm Vittorio Vantola. So thanks for this, which is very interesting. And while I was listening to you, I'm thinking that, uh, the, I mean, it is nice work, but the, the basic problem with this is that basically we are trying to use IP addresses or subnets to approximate other information, which could be, I mean, mostly, I think, to, to things, either the AS or ISP or network location of the, of the user, or the country when it's a matter of like uh, abiding by jurisdiction, data localization and so So I'm thinking whether it, at least as a mid-long-term solution, we don't need to work on something else rather than <laughs> the client subsetting. So maybe a new extension that communicates directly either the AS or an indicator of the network position or the, the country so that the, even the, the authoritative on the other side knows that that's what you really are talking about because otherwise the authoritative will always think that you are actually thinking about an IP address that you that you that in fact is just a proxy for other information. So maybe this is a discussion we need to have uh, in a SOP or something. Yeah, it's it's not that this is a question, but I, I agree. We need to uh, analyze uh, all the use cases, and that's what we are doing, uh, figuring out all the issues. Unfortunately, I didn't come up with the uh, with the, with a solution that replaces ECS right now, so I can't come and say, okay, no, guys, we shouldn't use that. We should like consider other cases, uh, other other things. Uh, but uh, hopefully we can in the future because using subnets uh, the way that they are used right now is far from ideal. Hi, uh, David Lawrence, and for better or for worse, my name is on that spec. Um, in part because <laughs> essentially what happened was uh, Google originally with in cooperation with OpenDNS started pursuing it and they deployed something. And at that point, we had to kind of describe what was going on. And that's how the RFC came about. And even at the time, there were a number of changes that I wanted to make because within the, the spec there, it, it does have a number of shortcomings, uh, definitely. And um including some like you can't control what an auth server is doing. Like you pointed out a number of servers that give invariant responses. Um, and those responses, there's actually a way in the spec to signal that no matter what subnet you ask, you will always get this answer. And so therefore you should cache it more efficiently. But a number of implementations don't do that. Um, so the main reason I got up was to ask, uh, like it, ECS adoption was very good people are motivated to do it. I'm not sure how much motivation implementers will have to move to another thing, but if they're going to move to another thing, they're also going to need a spec. <laughs> and so were you or your colleagues planning on bringing some draft to the ITF to discuss a, 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 a enhanced privacy way of addressing this problem? Uh, currently we're at a stage where we're trying to assess all uh, all kinds of usages of ECS. We're running into different problems, as I uh, as I told, with large ISPs, with uh, small ISPs. We see how CDNs use it. Once we have it all like, thought through, maybe we'll finally come with a, with an idea. But you're right that uh, people will not be happy to uh, start using a different thing about uh, instead of ECS. 
maybe this kind of a proxy solution, maybe a library that allows you to use you, you to use the same mechanism but in a different way, like we do. Uh, maybe it will be a better solution than a, than a new than a whole new spec. Who knows? We will see. And I forgot to mention, indeed, you mentioned that when you were talking. Uh, the problem with uh, caching efficiency is uh, mostly not because the spec is bad. Spec was uh, mentioning the ways to uh, improve caching efficiency. Uh, the problem is that name servers don't follow it. They just return the 24 scope and that's it. Uh, and this is out of your control. As a recursor, you can't do anything with that. Uh, so th that's mostly the problem with that motivated us, well, one of two that motivated us to think about an alternative solution. And Lewis, I can. Um, the root cause of this is using the DNS for traffic engineering is going to be special. That's what they're trying to do. They were tr you're trying to, to, people are trying to move traffic, but telling the DNS, put things here and there. And I, I used to do this as a business uh, long in the past. It's just really hard to do that. But what I really want to say here was what I didn't hear in the talk was the motivation for by the publisher of the DNS data for wanting to do this. Because there, there are two major motivations, and I think you did allude to these, and there sometimes it's by legal jurisdiction, like I have content that can only be visible in Asia or only visible in Europe, you know, sports events like that. But sometimes the motivation is to route traffic according to the topology of the network. Could please come again according to? What, so the first one I'm worried about, where is the user? Is the user in China? Is the mm -hmm. user in Asia, Europe? Mm -hmm. Where are they for the legal definition because my content restricted there? Mm -hmm. That's a different distinction than I only want I want to serve everyone on, a, on ASN 701, uh, at and in North America. I want them to have traffic because I have data centers on at and network. But if it goes to the Comcast network, I want to, there's a topological split. And that's what makes it tough for this is because if I want to express my rule of where this traffic should go, sometimes it's going to be by geolocation and sometimes it's by topology. And I think that's something that you consider. So when you try to solution this, what you put, what, what piece of data you put down, it might be a jurisdiction or it might be a location on a network location. It's very tough to do this is what I'm trying to say that there's, you have to look at the motivation for trying to distinguish the traffic. Right, in order to know what to send. That I, I want to say I'm here, or it was like, for example, 701 is a big, it's like the comp, it's a big, where in the US am I? It does, 701 just says where I am in ATT, but not where I am sitting. And that's something you have to consider in trying to understand actually why this is the way it is and what they're trying to solve. Uh, that, that's, well, that was the point of the last iteration. So uh, the last iteration that I was talking about is when we uh, added. Uh, more granularity and not rely just on the ISNs, but also rely on the country and on the region, on the su on subdivision. It's not granular enough anyway. If you take Comcast, for instance, uh, uh, it can have like lots of servers in a, in, in a single state or at and But if you uh, make it more granular, if you, inter for instance, try to split it on the city level, you kind of run into the same problem. You will just come to to back to subnets to to twenty four subnets. Yeah, that's yeah, the problem. It, 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 we can talk about this later. But if you sometimes somebody wants granularity, that's a problem. It's, but they want granularity in different ways. Yeah, it's a hard problem. It's not just you know it's, this this is just the, the vehicle for conveying information. And it was it's like a this is what we came up with at one point. Um, but it's a harder problem. And traffic engineering is the thing you're trying to achieve. And the DNS is can help you there, but we keep bumping our heads in the, on the wall trying to do this. So it's it's not an easy thing to solve, that's what yeah. I'm trying to say. We have another question in the chat. Uh, Victor Rugovny from Google asks, uh, how much ongoing maintenance are you willing to do to keep the heuristics adequate on an ongoing basis? The heuristics will likely need changes over time. Uh, we actually reload uh, all the lists uh, on a daily basis and kind of rebuild it. Mm -hmm. Also, what I didn't forget forgot to mention is that uh, Edgar TNS code is actually open source and it's under some uh, under a restrictive license. But if you want to look at how it's implemented, you can go to our GitHub. 
in just well take a look and one more question which is for me but sure. I can see uh what are your sources of data for the mapping is it just maxmind or is it like pulling bgp table from somewhere no, or we, what we decided to not uh, pull bgp data i understand the question uh we decided to not pull bgp data and rely on maxmind mostly because it was easier to implement uh and for now uh, we haven't yet uh, faced any issues with, uh, with uh, there were some fears that uh, there might be some uh, something out of sync or Max Pine being unreliable, but so far it's pretty good. No problems with that. That was our last question. It seems there are no more questions in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.